Welcome back to chapter 29 in module 6. In this last video for the chapter, we're going to touch on very briefly some of the much more difficult topics of cosmology. So we want to think about what the universe is really made out of. Um, one thing that we aren't covering in this class that does show up in the textbook is that space has what's called curvature, and it tells us about how much stuff there is and the density. And we're not going to focus on that portion of the discussion. What we are going to focus on is once we've decided the density of the universe, what is the breakdown of what's there? This chart here currently represents our best estimates for the composition of the universe. And it is really important that we recognize that this has changed drastically over the last couple of decades. The textbook has a pretty cool diagram that shows what the best estimates looked like in the last few decades. And again, because of our focus um, for this part of the curriculum and the time that we have, we're not gonna go into why those changes happened. But rest assured, it's the scientific process in action. We come up with the best fit to our observations. And when we gather new observations that don't fit the model, we have to come up with a new model. The hypothesis gets proven wrong and we fix it. So if we look at this pie chart, what we see is that ordinary matter is the smallest portion of the pie. Ordinary matter refers to stuff that is made of the atoms that we think of, protons and neutrons and electrons. That includes us in a tiny portion of that, but most of the ordinary matter is just clouds of gas and dust that's out there, not even in stars or in any more dense structure, but just kind of diffuse spread out through the universe, hydrogen and helium. Then, there, then there's a big piece of the pie that is dark matter. So about a quarter of what's in the universe is dark matter. We first mentioned dark matter back in chapter 25 when we talked about the rotation curve of the Milky Way galaxy and how it told us that if gravity behaves the way that we think it does, there has to be extra mass out in the outer reaches of the galaxy in the halo that isn't making any kind of light and isn't producing any kind of electromagnetic radiation. That's what we mean by dark matter. And now we have this new idea, first seen in this chapter, dark energy, and we will only briefly touch on it because really dark energy has nothing at all to do with dark matter. It's one of these cases of a kind of nickname that is easy to remember, but not very applicable, like the Big Bang nickname. And dark energy is kind of a stand-in for something that fights against gravity. And we'll talk about that when we get to it in this um, last couple of slides. But first, dark matter. So no one really knows exactly what dark matter is, and it's a lot easier to actually say what it isn't. For a long time, scientists thought that maybe dark matter was um, brown dwarfs and rogue planets and black holes, objects that we've already talked about or have thought briefly about in this class, that just don't shine. These would have mass, they would be um, compact objects out in the halo of the galaxy, and so scientists called them massive compact halo objects or machos. Unfortunately, we've ruled out machos as being the answer to our dark matter question, and it has to do with the amount of deuterium, a specific isotope of hydrogen that exists in the universe. And again, the details of that are outside the scope of the course, but rest assured we had this idea and we threw it out because it did not fit the observations, just like we have to in science. Instead, dark matter actually needs to be non-baryonic. Baryons refer to protons and neutrons and electrons, the kind of standard particles that build all of the stuff in the room around you, that build the computer or phone that you're um, watching this on. All of this stuff is, is made of baryons. Non-baryonic means it's a particle outside of that set um, that for a while it was thought neutrinos could be the answer here. 
but we need a lot of really, really small particles that have enough mass to just kind of exist. They would interact very weakly with regular matter because otherwise it'd be easy to find them. And so they're called weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. So sometimes astronomers can come up with good acronyms. Now, the reason why neutrinos are something we can comment on is because neutrinos do weakly interact with matter. We talked about neutrino telescopes briefly in chapter 16. The problem is neutrinos don't actually have enough mass to um, be able to fit the observations we have of dark matter. And so they aren't the top candidate for these WIMPs. There are dozens of projects that are either being built, have been built, are currently working, that are searching for dark matter. And a lot of that work is going to help us rule out ideas that we have, even if we don't find things right away. If you build something to look for a specific particle with certain properties and you don't find that particle, then maybe that particle isn't the, the best fit. So this is one of these cases where we're reaching the edge of current understanding, which helps to remind us that science is an ongoing process. It's a progress report to take a class in science where certainly a lot of what we've covered before this chapter is stuff that's been well established. We aren't getting into the nuances and details of the stuff everybody's currently working on, just getting to the big picture understanding. But here in chapter 29, even to talk about big picture understanding requires standing right at the edge of our understanding in science. Okay, so the last question that we had listed at the beginning of this chapter is, what is the eventual fate of the universe? Any model we come up with has to be a solution to Einstein's gravitational field equations. So there's, there's mathematical limitations on what scientists can come up with. And any model we come up with has to fit observations. Now, the four most important observations that I want us to remember that we've touched on is that we know the universe is expanding. That is a um, effect that we see when Hubble's law works to describe distances to um, galaxies. We see all of the distant galaxies moving away from us. They're redshifted. So the universe is expanding. Any model we come up with has to agree with the minimum apparent age of the universe. We've been talking about this age of 13.7 or 13.8 billion years for the Big Bang to now. And when we say minimum apparent age, we mean specific objects for which we have a measured age. If we have seen a globular cluster that shows us an age consistent with 12 billion years, we know that the universe has to have existed for 12 billion years. We look around for different things that we can get ages for, and it has, that model has to agree with those observed ages. It must explain the observed chemical element abundance. The first step is recognizing that the universe, when we look at what it's made of in terms of regular baryons, the regular stuff, it is about 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. That is a consequence of the three minutes of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. The phrase was on our slides. We don't need to memorize that phrase. But the three minutes we had of a hot, dense universe that was able to go through some of these fusion processes to build hydrogen and helium. We need to have our model be able to replicate that stage of building that matches what we currently see. And finally, any um, model of the universe has to explain the cosmic microwave background, that glow that we have once the universe cooled down enough to let photons flow freely. We talked about the cosmic microwave background as our key focus of the previous video. Now, there are lots of possible models, and this picture shows kind of a first glance at some of them, and there are other figures in the book 
um, in this section that can help us see some of the differences. But I want to point out something important here. First of all, the far left picture where there was a Big Bang moment, the universe has been expanding and expanding for a certain amount of time, including up to now, and at some point in the future it will start to collapse down to the hot, dense, early stage that we started with, called the Big Crunch. This is a pretty cool model because it's one that could then repeat itself in time, that we go from Big Bang to Big Crunch, and then the whole universe can kind of give itself a big reset. Unfortunately, that has been completely ruled out by observations of the expansion rate of the universe. And so although it's presented as the full set of possibilities, and it's the one that I liked best when I was taking um, introductory astronomy way back when, um, it's, it's one that we can very safely rule out completely. Now, the other options here are showing if we had an expansion rate that was slowing down, staying the same, or getting faster. And what we now know is that the universe is accelerating its expansion. Measurements of type 1a supernova in distant galaxies that were made in uh, the 1990s and very recently got a Nobel Prize in physics show us that the expansion rate for really distant objects is slower. So in the past, the expansion rate was slower than it currently is. We aren't going to get into the details of this, so it's one of those things where we just kind of have to acknowledge the statement, the universe expansion is accelerating, without worrying about having a full, complete understanding because we're limited in our math and physics available in our curriculum. One explanation for the accelerating universe is that something is pushing back against gravity. And that's where dark energy comes in. It's also the case that in the textbook there is a description of um, inflation and the inflationary period. You can read through that if you're curious, but we're not going to cover that in this book, uh, in, in this uh, lecture video, or in our specific curriculum that I'm highlighting. And so I need, need us to recognize that there's, there's stuff that we could talk about if we had more time. And if we had a whole semester where we just focused on stars and galaxies, we would talk about it in more detail. But for now, uh, we just recognize that there's a lot of nuance to how we know what we know and how we've ruled out what we've ruled out. And at the moment, we are kind of stuck with this missing piece of the matter energy total that we call dark energy because we know that something has to be fighting against gravity's goal of always bringing stuff together. And that something currently as a stand-in hypothesis is called dark energy. So we're right at the top of this set of statements. And even the dark energy has a question mark because it's, it's something that is currently being worked on and figured out. And there's a lot of unknowns here. And at this point in the chapter and this point in the pyramid, you may have more questions than I have answers. And that's one of the beauties of science is that it really is an ongoing exploration. And the goal is to figure out what we don't know which means that in science, there's always going to be things that we don't know and that we're figuring out. One last philosophical note um, that the textbook ends the chapter with as well is the anthropic principle. There is something to be said about the fact that there's so many things about the universe that if they were slightly different, we wouldn't be here. If the matter-antimatter imbalance from the first couple of seconds after the Big Bang had really been a balance instead of um, slightly more matter, we wouldn't be here. If the universe's density was slightly higher or lower, then maybe we wouldn't have been able to create galaxies and then solar systems within those galaxies that could harbor planets and life and all of the things we have. There's this idea or statement that suggests that the universe can support life because if it couldn't support life, we wouldn't be here to be 
thinking about it and discussing it. And it's kind of a um, circular, uh, circular logic. It's called the anthropic principle, and it's kind of a valid statement a lot of scientists don't like that because it's not actually an answer to the question of why the universe is the way it is. But it's something to ponder and gets a lot more into philosophy than physics. But uh, that's one of the fun things about, uh, about classes like this is we get to think about those big picture ideas. So as a wrap up, I just want to make sure we understand that this chapter has a lot of stuff in it that is really difficult to think through. We will have some worksheets and supplementary videos and everything, um, but there's going to be a lot of questions that you might have that don't get answered for this particular chapter because those answers just aren't out there yet. Scientists are working on them and so you can always check back in a decade or two. A list, uh, as I usually do when there are um, activities from supplemental workbooks that you might be using. Um, here they are. And this is the end of module six. So thank you for listening, and I will see you in the next module.